Are you looking to become an out-of-state landlord but not sure on how to find property managers or how to even manage these properties on your own? No worries. This is a common question and pain point beginner investors face. In this video, we interview Aaron Amin, an eight-time real estate investor that has developed a step-by-step -step playbook to build a team and self-manage your own rentals. You'll receive actionable tips to help you get started today. My name is Ariel Herrera, your co-host of a tech and real estate podcast where we bridge the gap between real estate and technology. If you enjoy tips on self-managing and getting started in real estate, then please like this video so I know to make more content like it. All right, let's get started. Hey, Aaron, welcome to the channel. So happy to have you here. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, super excited because we both come from a similar community, both followers of one rental at a time. So really building your cash flow and wealth over a period of time rather than just rapidly in six months, sometimes that we hear on um, other podcasts. But with that, uh, I really love that you also have done long distance real estate investing, whether that be by accident or by choice, um, similar to myself. And before we get into your story of long distance investing and what you've learned, love to hear a little bit more about your background. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for the introduction. I um, So my name is Aaron Amin. I live in Houston, Texas with my wife and three young children. I have three kids under the age of three, the two-year-old daughter, and then two twin boys that are just turning four months old this, this month. So we have a busy household. Uh, I work full-time by day in the management consulting industry. Uh, I've worked as a consultant for the last four years. Prior to that, I worked for 10 years in the concerts and live entertainment industry. Uh, so I was a, I was a booker. So I, I was at concerts four to five nights a week and working um, work the desks um, you know, at, in, in the booking and marketing office for a large entertainment company. Um, I went to school. I graduated with a business administration degree and you know, really kind of, uh, I also have a background as a musician. That's how I ended up in the, in the concerts industry. So uh, I've had a full-time job ever since college, uh, but also my wife and I have built a portfolio of eight single-family rental properties spread out across Washington, Nevada, and Iowa. So the closest rental that we own currently is a thousand miles away from us here in Houston. Um, and so, yeah, we're we're very familiar with long-distance investing. As we get into my story a little bit, you'll see some of it kind of happened um, by circumstance, not necessarily. We didn't start long distance. But now a good portion of the time I spend outside of my job and family is to um, educating others on how to invest remotely and do it with confidence, conquer the anxiety of what it feels like to own property far away from where you live. Um, and yeah, I, I built a whole educational program with a partner of mine on how to um, you know get people their first long distance rental property. So that's kind of the nutshell. And I'm happy to dive into any of that, that you, you want to. Yeah, that's excellent. I, I do want to pick your brain really quickly on uh, being a musician in your past, what instruments have you played? So I am a drummer through and through. I started playing drums when I was 10 years old. So going on 25 years now, um, I was very, very keen on making that my profession. So all through middle school, high school, like I was dead set on um, on being a drummer professionally. And I did play. Uh, I played in various symphonies. And so I, I did more traditional concert style percussion. And then I also played in rock bands. And um, I did some regional touring with um, with a band uh, for a few years, all while I was, you know, still in school and, and working. Um, so there's a whole kind of story of how that was balanced. That was before I had a wife and kids, right? So that might, that might explain a few things on how that fit in. But, um, but I ultimately had to make the decision. Ironically, when I worked in the concerts industry, I no longer had time to perform. So I kind of traded being on stage for being a supporting, you know, um, contributor within the industry on putting on concerts. That makes sense. Super impressive. And it seems like you've always had this want to be creative and would love to see like how that kind of started your journey into real estate. So when you first got into real estate, was your thought that you wanted more creative freedom? So you wanted to achieve financial freedom or was there a different way that your journey began? Yeah. You know, um, I'll, I get pretty personal here, right? That I worked in the concerts industry for about 10 years and I started in Seattle, which is where I mostly grew up. That's where I went to college. And I um, moved down to Las Vegas in 2015 to help open a new office uh, of the company I was working for. And 
we, you know, Las Vegas is known for many things. Uh, entertainment is one of them and uh, hard living is also another. And um, so, you know, I, I had a lot of fun, arguably too much fun at times, but I was also working, you know, 60, 70, sometimes 80 hours a week. I would be working, you know, during the day, uh, normal office hours, Monday through Friday. But I also had to cover shows. You know, I had work functions at shows three, four nights a week. So there was not a lot of balance whatsoever. And there was not a lot of room for creativity. And that over a long period of time, you know, I turned to kind of more destructive habits. I, my mental health was kind of eroding uh, slowly and then not so slowly. And so and in, uh, it culminated in May of 2019. Uh, I ended up doing a short stint in inpatient rehab to kind of just change, you know, change course abruptly um, because I could tell that if I kept doing what I was doing, both from a career standpoint and from a um, just habits standpoint, it was not going to take me to where I wanted to go. So with that, I unlocked all this additional energy and all this time that I had spent channeling towards my my vices and slowly building this resentment towards my career. As you mentioned, I'm, I'm a creative person by nature. And that outlet that I used to have from playing drums, once that faded further and further away, uh, a part of me was missing. And so as I came out of that chapter, my wife and I, we had just gotten married the year before. And we realized like, we want to build something that's a bit bigger than just, you know, clocking into a job and working 70, 80 hours a week and burning out. Um, and so we decided to start investing in real estate. That was one, that was one place where I immediately started channeling my, my energy. I do have real estate in my family. So my, my mom and my stepdad uh, have owned rental properties of varying, they've had different composures of their portfolios starting in the early 2000s, but they also did long distance investing. They also did it while working full-time. They wow. both had full-time demanding jobs. And so um, I didn't pay as much attention to it at the time, but once I kind of had that creative reawakening, if you will, um, and decided that, hey, we're going to we're gonna take a shot and, and try and um, you know, build a rental portfolio, I started being able to access and ask them questions and learn from their experience. And it's really been interesting. So I've been at this for about seven years now. And throughout that time, I'm kind of able to access these different moments from their experience too. And, and seeing how they navigated through the, the Great Recession, through a couple of different repositionings and selling and, and moving. And um, clearly, that was sub subconsciously an inspiration for me uh, as, as we kind of blazed our own path. We've moved three times since we uh, started investing. We went from localized investors to long distance investors. So um, a lot of kind of life experience mixed in with the real estate experience, um, you know, that it's kind of hard. I guess hard to make up and something that you know we, we learned as we went. I think it's really great that you were able to self-reflect at a certain period and realize mental health wise that it was important for you to maybe switch what you were doing on a day-to-day -day and also look in the long term what could help you to unlock some of that previous creativity or parts that made you excited about every day. Um, also great that you touched on being able to lean a little bit on relatives that have prior experience in investing. And I think that's huge for any newbie getting into the space, whether it's someone that they know in their circle or someone that they reach out to, maybe on the bigger pockets community, to try to learn from them. And it doesn't even have to be even be an investor. It could even be a contractor or an agent. Someone that's just in the space is really useful to feel that confidence um, early on. 100%. And I, I should also share that it wasn't until our fifth rental that I read my first Bigger Pockets book. And um, I share that not because I think that's a good idea. I actually don't because um, there's so much information that's available either for free or for cheap. You know, just even some of the books I got on my shelf, those are 10 to $15. And um, there's a wealth of wisdom packed in there. Um, but I think, you know, for me, we learned a lot by doing, which I appreciate. There's certainly things we could have done better. And that's a large reason why Myself and my partner, we started this um, this academy that's really meant to retrace some of the stuff that we could have done better, and you know provide that as an outlet up front. And especially like I didn't start as a remote investor, but when we moved away from Las Vegas, we had four rentals there, and we had to make a decision of whether we stay 
you know, sell them uh, or keep them and figure out how to manage them remotely. And I'm very happy that we decided to keep them and just problem solve through that. And um, in doing so, create a bit of a playbook on on how, um, you know, we learned some some tough mistakes, but uh, also uh, have slowly improved over time. And six, six and a half years later, we have those rentals and they're doing well and they're among the best performing in our portfolio. If, you know, we've, we've let time do its trick, which in real estate, if you don't let time play out, if you're a buy and hold investor, you are kind of robbing yourself of, um, of the, the real benefits if, um, yeah. if you can't hold on. Definitely. And before we dive into that playbook of what you did when you moved out from your local rentals, could you give a little bit of a background of what are those rentals? Are they long-term? I think you kind of touched on that. Um, have any of them become short-term or do you house hack any at any point? Could you explain? Sure. Yeah. So we have, every house we own has been a long-term single family buy and hold. Uh, we did live in three of the rentals we have three of the eight rentals at one point or another. So we did a few of these live then rent. We've never done anything that's a big construction or uh, renovation. So we're not, you know, we haven't done these kind of fancier strategies where you, you go buy something at a 40% of the list price and put, you know, a ton of money out of pocket into renovations. We were, we were pretty traditional buy and hold investors. And so we, the first house we ever bought, we lived in, we got married in the backyard. We, um, wow. you know, it was it was a traditional kind of young young couple buying a starter home, um, and we, of course, it was a 1940 house. You know, so it had some quirks, and we learned quickly some of the joys of home ownership with repairs. And you know, you can't just call your landlord and have them fix it, and you kind of were your own landlord in a sense. Um, and there's an interesting story behind that house where we lived in it for three years. We did a cash out refi on that house. Um, you know, we pulled some equity out, used that to buy two more houses as rentals. Then we turned it into a rental when we moved. And then we actually sold that house last year um, using what's called the capital gains exclusion, where essentially if, um, and I'm getting a little technical here, but when when a house appreciates and it's under 500,000 in uh, appreciation, if you've lived there in two out of the last five years, uh, in the IRS's eyes, uh, as a as a married household, you don't have to pay tax on those gains. So because we had lived there for three years and we sold it within that range, we were able to take um, you know quite a bit of profit tax free. So that was um, so we got those four uses out of it, right? We got we lived in it, refied it to buy more rentals, rented it, and sold it. Um, and that's just one of the houses, right? I I, I don't want to burn the whole clock and dissect all of them. But uh, we did also buy and live in a house in Washington. And we did that actually twice. And we and we hold both of those still. That is huge. I mean, the fact that you took one property and you've been able to leverage it through the HELOC or being able to cash out refi, then being able to sell it down the line, put it towards other properties, like amazing, amazing way that you can take your primary home and be able to do so much with it down the line. So now that you've shifted, you were living in Vegas, had properties there, moved. What were some of the nuances that came with that in terms of being an out-of-state landlord? Yeah. So let's, um, for some context, you know, March, I think it was 13th, 2020. I think we all kind of remember that week when stuff was shutting down um, slowly but surely due to COVID. So in the entertainment industry, and especially in Las Vegas, that whole town is built on people being able to come in and visit and you know buy tickets to events. And so, you know, the the US national unemployment peaked, I believe, at 14.9%, but Vegas hit 25% in a matter of weeks. And you know, I was working in in the concerts industry. So my position was furloughed. And essentially I was given the choice of you can either you know, wait around for your job to come back. But at the time, we didn't know if concerts were going to be shut down for four weeks or two years. I mean, at the time, people were literally talking about, we don't know when we'll be able to have concerts again. It could be 2022. This was back in 2020, right? So 
the idea of sitting around and just waiting for your job to come back. Also knowing some of the stuff I said earlier, where I'd be going back to a job that was pretty underpaid compared to how hard it was working me. And um, it just gave me that opening to, to make a change, but it was a very difficult climate. Um, finding another job in Vegas just didn't seem possible at that time. And so what I did is, you know, my wife and I sat down and we thought, you know, we, we knew we wanted to have kids sometime soon. Las Vegas is not a very ideal place to raise children for many reasons. And, um, and so we opened up the map and we said, let's, where can we, where can we find, um, where can I find a job? Where would we like to live? Can we be closer to some family? Like what, what can we do? So I looked at my professional network and having graduated uh, in Seattle, most of my contacts were up in Seattle. So anyway, long story short, I ended up getting a, a, a job through um, someone in my network. That's a consulting company I work at now. And all the while, like that decision was top of mind, right? We were just trying to figure out how to be able to stabilize our household finances. Second to that was, hey, we have four rentals. What do we, where we have four houses. What do we do with these? Do we sell them? Four houses in Vegas is probably the price of one in Seattle. So do we sell all four rentals that we've spent a lot of time building up just to buy a primary up there? Or do we figure out something else? So we thankfully decided to, you know, take, take a risk, even though it was uncomfortable. And we ended up renting up in Seattle and um, keeping our rentals. Uh, so we, we became renters, but then also turned our house into a rental. And it was an interesting dichotomy, right? Cause you feel like, oh, I'm, maybe I'm not moving forward if I'm renting from someone else. But at the same time, if you own four rentals, arguably, um, you know, you, you have found a way to move your financial future forward just by making that move. And I'm really glad we did because we didn't end up staying in Seattle. So, um, you know, if we had kind of rearranged all our chips, it would have, it would have been short-sighted in the long run, but as to how we actually did it. So we, because it was 2020 in the middle of COVID and there was a lot of volatility and risk around renters and there were moratoriums in place. Uh, we were very, very lucky that three, the three houses that were already rentals had stabilized tenants that we had found in place. And, um, and then we were able to find someone to move into our house within seven days of us leaving. So we had just done fresh lease ups and we had already talked to them about there being longer term um, leases. So we decided instead of bringing on a property manager in the middle of all that, we'll just self-manage these. Uh, not a path I would recommend for everyone, but at the same time, I think a lot of the lessons you know that I learned and a lot of the stuff that I teach now is just about clear communication with tenants, setting proper expectations and making sure you have the different scenarios kind of gamed out. So we had a go-to electrician, we had a go-to plumber, we had a handyman who was very quick to respond and could be on site quickly. And then we even had someone um, who I worked with and who uh, trusted deeply, who we had, we paid a small retainer to kind of just be our first line of defense. So if anything needed, a, uh, you know, eyes on it for a judgment call to make sure, you know, we weren't being um, taken advantage of in any way he was able to go out and make those calls. So rather than hire a full stop property manager and pay the 10% plus all the um, ancillary costs, you know, we decided to kind of build our own team and we have never gone back on that. There's been some bumps in the road, but we've been able to successfully self-manage those for six and a half years. And, um, and I say six and a half, cause I'm including the time that we were kind of building and buying those original ones um, and, and uh, our primary too. So um, not including two other chapters, which is the two out that we bought in Washington and the three we bought in Iowa. But um, that was kind of our original path into long distance investing and self-managing remotely. That is excellent. I mean, wow. The fact that when you were on this journey of first being a long distance real estate investor and you were able to get new tenants in within seven days of you leaving, like that's just shows that the systems that you have in place and the judgment is just very high and, and, and very good. Um, I also really respect that like most landlords who are property managers, long distance, it was kind of an accident at first. Um, you were kind of in a do or die moment where it was, you know, you don't know when you're going to get your job back. And 
in order to survive and be able to make an income, you decided to move and then thought, well, am I just going to leave, you know, all my rentals? Am I going to put it in the hands of someone who may not try to um, look out for it in the best way that I could? Should I sell everything? But instead, you didn't let fear get in your way. And you start, decided to make a systematized way to go about it. So without giving too much of the secret sauce away, could you uh, detail a little bit more about uh, maybe what systems specifically you put into place and maybe some research that you initially did? Sure. Yeah. So I'll use those Vegas properties as an example. Uh, and obviously the COVID was an extraordinary circumstance, but essentially the the kind of the team and the, and the tech stack that we've used has been pretty simple. We have you know an agent there that we know and trust who helped us buy our rentals and he can provide lease up services. So I know there's websites and um, there's technologies that are built for investors that also do the same thing, but we prefer to use our trusted agent just because we we know him and we have that relationship. Um, but we also have done lease ups through apartments.com. It used to be called Cozy back when we started using it and then apartments.com acquired it. Uh, and I know the name is misleading because they, they have a full suite of uh, rental property management tools. So you can collect applications, you provide a link and the tenants, they pay $30, it does a full uh, criminal background check, credit check, and they have to fill in their information with all their references. And only when they fill that out and pay, does it show up in your queue that, hey, you received a qualified application, then you can go through and do the due diligence, call the employer, call the previous landlord, call any personal references. So the majority of the work is on them to provide all that information. And then you can pretty quickly kind of understand if, um, you know, by, by doing your own due diligence and looking at their file, kind of what their risk profile is. So yes, ordinarily, a lot of people lean on their property manager for that. But even if you have a property manager, I highly recommend being involved in that process so that you know who's living in your property. Um, there are... There is no perfect science to how you screen and select tenants. And as a matter of fact, there's a lot of regulations uh, to make sure that you aren't unfairly discriminating. You have to be very, very careful about that too, right? We all want, you know, stable um, people with very secure income. And there's there's things that most landlords want, but you also have to be just super careful. You're not um, breaking any rules with how you screen. So that part is probably the most stressful part of the process when you're self-managing because uh, you, when your house is vacant and you aren't there, that's the stressful part when, when you don't know what's going on and you can't see it. So once, once you get a tenant in, it becomes a lot easier. So apartments.com also has, as do, as do many other sites, they have features where you can log a maintenance request. So as long as you explain to the tenant, like, don't text me a photo, like log it in the portal. And that creates a ticket. Um, and it creates a paper trail for you. So they have to upload a picture and then put a, a description. And that comes to you. From there, you have a list of people that you can either call, um, you know, a handyman, whatever the appropriate type of vendor is. And, um, and you can kind of deal with coordinating that. Um, at this point in our journey, we use VAs to help with that. Uh, and there's a whole rabbit hole I could go with there, but we have a fractional um, VA support from our team. So I don't have to pay them 40 hours a week just to answer occasional emails. It's pay for what you use. So we've been able to kind of build that into our system now that we have eight of these across three states. Um, but the upfront work is really just about building a list of vendors, you know, getting in their system so that there's a quick response uh, process when something does come up and then ideally you know finding that leasing agent whether you use a website or a local agent that you know and trust uh and finding your on the ground support for stuff that comes up so we do have kind of different systems in in each market and we do have a full stop property manager in washington so um it's not that we're strictly we will only self manage it's really situational depending on where we are and kind of the quality of the the team members we can find. That's a great point. Yeah, quality of team members you could find. And a lot of it is not like so much of an unknown. A lot of it can be a checklist of things you need to do in a chronological order. And when it comes to finding people to build a vineyard team, 
Is it more so you asking um, the agent that you go with, like who they trust, or do you go on Yelp? What are some methods to take to find like the best contractors or landscapers, for example? Yeah, so it's a great question. And that's something that we definitely spend a lot of time on uh, when I'm coaching people. I have a series of uh, interview templates and like very nice. specific detailed questions that I go through beyond just, hey, do you sell houses? Hey, <laughs> do you manage properties, right? There's, um, there's you want to get, you know, let's talk about property managers, I guess, for a minute first. You want someone who has the right mix of units. You know, they manage the type of properties that you have. They don't have too many. They don't have too few. They have the right composure on their team. If it's just one person, do they have 900 units to manage? That might not work. But similarly, if they have 1,200 units to manage and they have a team of 10, you know, are you, is there going to be uh, disjointedness in the way that they communicate and delegate? So for some of those reasons, that's how I ended up self-managing is because I've I've struggled in multiple markets to find the right balance of who can effectively manage given the size and um, and systems of their business. Um, so as far as individual vendors go, I do have actually our VAs help uh, a lot with doing some initial research, scrubbing reviews. And um, like if we're talking about basic uh, services like plumbing and electrical and stuff like that. Um, so they'll scrub the reviews and then I'll usually get on the phone and call because some of these, it's sometimes it's a company, sometimes it's just a person. Um, so you just want to understand like the composure of like, what is this person's business? Is this someone that works full time and they do this on the side, you know, on their lunch break, or is it a company that has 15 years of history, um, you know, and, and good reviews and a, a large body of work to show. So I think you just, we accept a lot of things at face value in general, um, in, in life. I mean, that's a very blanket statement, but I think you have to go click a few layers deeper when you think about someone that you would trust to perform some tor- some type of work on your house without your direct oversight, right? That's, that's a different level of trust. And I, I think you, the due diligence that's associated with that is just a little bit deeper. The other thing I always recommend is never, never interview only one person yeah. for any position. And that's a mistake I've made multiple times. There's a couple hires uh, that I made out of the gate with, because everything sounded good at the surface. Um, but I did not interview multiple options and it did ended up not working out. Some of that is, you know, due to circumstance, it's kind of out of your control, but at the same time, um, you know, if you think about most big decisions you make in life, it's helpful to have multiple perspectives and have things to compare against versus just kind of accepting the first things that, that comes along. Um, so I don't know if that, hopefully that answered at least part of your question. That, yeah, that is uh, spot on. And it actually reminds me, and if I just do a quick analogy here. So a lot of the audience are folks who may have experience in the tech industry. And when I used to interview for companies, uh, as I got to the final rounds, my questions would be, okay, so how big is the analytics team for this company? If it's like 10 folks and the company's over a thousand people and they're supporting five different business lines, I'm like, oh wait, that's a red flag. This is going to end up being a job where I'm working 80 hour weeks and there's not enough staff, not enough resources. So taking that mindset and also being able to ask the same kind of questions, but for property managers, like what does the portfolio size look like, the team, uh, types of properties, then it really helps to narrow down, like, would they even be a viable fit? So I think it's really amazing that you've been able to kind of build a system to ask the right questions and then assess, you know what, this might not be the right move. And instead, I should be managing this and build my own team myself. Here's another layer I'll add to that is you're when you're building a rental portfolio, you're building a business, whether you invest in one state or one neighborhood or five states, you are building a business and potentially you're building it alongside your family. You have likely a vision for your future. You likely have values and it's important to think through what those values are. And when you hire teammates, especially someone as consequential as a property manager, it's not that they can't fit into that vision, but you have to understand what phase they're in in their business. 
yeah. who they are as people. You know, are they trying to, if they're at a hundred units now, are they trying to get to a thousand by the next 24 months? Um, you know, and if so, at what cost? Uh, so there's a lot of alignment that is, even if it's right in the moment, it may come apart down the road. And so I think that's another element that people might not consider all the time when, if you want to have a little more control and influence over how your portfolio will grow over time, then sometimes it's helpful to have those levers closer um, within your control. And when you hire a property manager, you are ceding a lot of that control over to them by design. Uh, So it's just, it's not a right or wrong thing. It's just something to be aware of as you try and figure out what you want your lifestyle to be and how you want your business to grow. If you're a buy and hold investor and you're buying things on 30 year notes and you're in your thirties or forties, I mean, what are the chances your same property manager is going to be managing that 30 or 40 years from now, right? It's so it helps to learn these skills so that when, not if, when you have to pivot, you at least kind of know uh, how to cover your bases, uh, if that makes sense. I completely agree. And very, very good points to mention. Um, I would love for you to highlight, Aaron, uh, that with all the information that you've been able to provide today, you also have a YouTube channel too, where you provide information. Could you give a little bit more of an explanation of your YouTube channel? Sure. Yeah. So, so speaking of creativity, right. I, uh, we talked about how there was a bit of a creative gap, uh, when I was deep in my entertainment career days. And, um, I have filled that mostly with, uh, I run my own podcast and YouTube channel. It's called the hybrid real estate professional. And uh, I'll be having you on it shortly as well. But uh, the whole idea is the hy- a hybrid real estate professional is someone who leverages skills, income, and other characteristics from every part of their life and apply it toward becoming a real estate investor. So typically, there are people such as yourself, you know, who you have a deep background in data, and you've you've used that and, and fused it into this identity that alongside your your um, real estate investing, and so. Uh, you're actually a perfect example of the type of person I like to have on the show. Um, and so I, I've, I think I'm on episode 29, closing in on 30. So I've run that since September. Uh, and I also have a, a newsletter that goes out three times a week under that same name. Um, and then I don't know if you want me to get into the Academy stuff yet. Yes, or, please. Or, okay. So in November, uh, I partnered with a gentleman named Nathan Murith. Uh, he's in the same community that I met you through. Uh, he and I are very similar. We have, uh, we both are married, multiple young kids, work full time. You know, very attached and driven by our careers. But we also own um, collectively over twenty out of state rentals. So he lives in California and invests in St. Louis and Indiana. I live in Texas and invest in Nevada, Washington, and Iowa. And so we got to know each other over the last couple of years, and we realized we were on a very similar path. We both love giving back. We both had been coaching people individually and we said, hey, let's put our heads together and create a a more guided, uh, structured curriculum to help people buy their first rental. Um, Half of it's mental. You know, a lot of people like the idea, but they they get stuck and they hit these different points of friction uh, in their in their journey to try and buy out of state rentals. Um, And so our program is a mix of the mindset and the tactics. We've structured it into a 12 week course. And um, it's very high touch. So you get a lot of direct coaching and guidance from us. Um, So each person, we we kind of monitor and make sure they don't get stuck anywhere. And if they do, we jump right in and help them get unblocked. Uh, But it goes over everything from, you know, building a strategy, um, you know, picking a market, building a team, analysis fundamentals, creating the correct buy box all the way into, you know, the last, the last half of the course is really focused on okay, how do we get the reps in and put the offers in and ultimately get you to a point where you have a, a house that directly fits with your strategy and goals under contract. Um, so the goal of the program is to get you the confidence and clarity um, so that you're out there and, and able to able to buy a house uh, that directly aligns with your long-term vision for what you want to do with real estate. Such valuable information. And one of the few courses that I've ever seen to be able to incorporate step-by-step plans within the real estate space of getting started, but also with the mindset aspect too, which is huge. And one of the main barriers I see newbies 
um, never get started because of that piece. You know, it's something I'm very passionate about too, because I think a lot of people get right up on the edge and they might even be putting offers out. But once the information starts to come back, they they freeze up a little bit. And there's yeah. there's some stuff that you got to work through. And ultimately, you know, fear of the unknown, no matter what the context, whether it's real estate or anything in life, is usually one of the hardest things to conquer. And so part of why we we mix mindset and tactics, the tactics is going to show you Here's everything that we do to minimize and mitigate risk as best as we possibly can. But the mindset piece is what's going to get you over the edge. And just know that you've done everything you can to cover your downside. The rest is just about taking action and getting started. Um, And from there, you start to piece together and build the bigger picture. Because, you know, buying the first property is is the beginning of the journey. It's not the end. And um, so I think that's, once you kind of get started and you know, yeah, you're going to, you're going to make a couple of mistakes. We're going to do our best if you're in the program to help you avoid the mistakes we made, but there is no perfect. There is no mistake free investing journey. Things will happen. So the best thing you can do is prepare yourself and, and accept that and, and um, you know, t- take a chance. Definitely. And for your remote real estate Academy, how many signups are you accepting for this round? So we have a cohort and we're planning to start uh, in May, the beginning of May, and we have 12 available seats total. And I believe at the time of this recording, we have about four of them spoken for. So I just immediately made this not evergreen anymore by by saying that. Uh, but we're we're keeping it small because we, like I said, it's very high touch. We want to be part of each person's journey. So we do a one-on-one onboarding call with either Nathan or myself at the beginning it's very deep. We get into what your goals are and where you might be stuck so far. And we give you some, some stuff to get started. Uh, and then you'll, you'll onboard at the same time as the rest of the cohort and you'll progress at the pace that's comfortable for you. And if you ever get stuck, you'll have us right there. And if you want to blaze through it and start submitting offers, you'll have us there to weigh in and give feedback and, and help coach you through it. So it's, it's really meant for that high touch. And, and as such, we, we we're going to keep it at, at that 12 to give everyone you know, the best possible experience. Excellent. So for those looking to learn more about the program, the course, as well as how to follow you on YouTube, could you give that information? Sure. So the the Academy is Remote Real Estate Academy, and you can find this at remoterealestateacademy.com. My YouTube channel and all my personal information about the hybrid real estate professional brand can be found. Just go to my name, aaronamin.com. I'll send it so you can uh, drop it in the show notes. But that has all the information about, um, yeah, my channel, my newsletter. And um, there's a ton of content on there, you know, that's uh, ahead of the paywall that's that's free. Um, if you just want to do some reading and breeze up on some of the strategies that we talked about. Uh, but, the, but the meat of the content and, you know, really kind of what we feel will get people over the hurdle and get their first rental. We put our heart and soul into building that, that course out. And, um, We're looking forward to welcoming the next round of people in. So exciting. Well, with that, thank you so much, Aaron, for your time. Your real estate background is so impressive, as well as all the tactics that you were able to provide. Looking forward to seeing more of your journey. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to having you on on my show very soon.